Good afternoon all and welcome to this new Finance D Stocks video where we will discuss the importance of high quality buildings for the health of tenants and steps that real estate owners can undertake to increase the health of their buildings. Um, and we will do so with Juan Palacios. So welcome Juan, great that uh, you're here. Um, you're a postdoctoral researcher at uh, MIT and you have done a ton of interesting research about this topic. So I'm really excited to uh, talk about the topic with you. Um, so before we talked about how this appears to be quite an overlooked topic, health and buildings, and how there's quite a discrepancy between healthy and unhealthy buildings. So what would you consider a healthy building and what would you consider to be an unhealthy building? Yeah, thank you so much uh, for the invitation, Walter. Yeah. Very happy to be here. First of all, less, uh, I'm very, very glad to have this conversation with you. Yeah. So uh, let me put it very simple. The reason why we construct uh, uh, offices or we construct uh, houses is to create a bubble, an environment that is different from the environment out there. Otherwise, we will be sleeping in the forest or we will be working in the middle of a park. But we want to create a different environment indoor that it is outdoor. So the whole idea of a healthy building is to create an environment that is better indoor than outdoor. In that sense, you can go from a different uh, spectrum from having an environment that is less bad than outdoor. So kind of that doesn't make people sick uh, that are being inside or the ones that actually even promote the health and well-being indoors. So when you are going, for example, to a place like uh, Delhi or Beijing five, ten years ago, it's very highly polluted outdoors. Uh, a lot of the, the construction or developers, what they are busy with is creating an indoor environment that keeps those particles out of the lungs of the occupants. So you can see that being indoors is healthier for you than being outdoors and spending your time indoors will actually generate a, a better health outcomes and even performance outcomes in terms mm -hmm. of cognitive performance and others than just spending your time outdoors. Okay. And if I understand you correctly, the concept of an unhealthy building is actually quite an overlooked problem. Do you have some examples of unhealthy buildings that uh, really affected uh, the tenants or really striked you? Well, um, I, instead of doing the shaming and blaming, I will give you a general building that is, mm -hmm. tra is traditionally bad. Mm -hmm. And that, I haven't seen a report in any country that will say that on average that type of buildings would be good for the occupants, and that is the schools. If you look at the schools, uh, primary schools, high schools, I can give you reports from the Netherlands, I can give you reports from the United States, that the building infrastructure of the schools is terrible. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not meeting the standards, and we are putting kids to learn mathematics, we are putting them to learn uh, language skills, and all of the things that are critical for their development as a person, as a, as a professional, yeah. in buildings that are systematically with bad ventilation, with uh, not uh, good thermal conditions, or no air conditioning, mm -hmm. and so forth. So. That is a typical building, and, and I guess that a lot of the, the, the listeners today will recall going to pick up their kids or, or going to pick up their brothers, sisters to, to the school and really feeling, oh, this is stuffy, this is uh, warm, and how can I be I here for yeah. more than, than an hour? So this is one of the things. Yeah, I, I think that's definitely uh, something people recognize. So you've done research about how actually uh, the environment of the building affects the health of the tenants. Can you? Talk a little bit how you have set up this research, uh, write some key papers, and what the results are of this research. Sure. So we've been, we've done this uh, uh, across different building types. So the first papers that we did were looking at homes and how, how home maintenance were affecting uh, the con the health of the of the occupants. We did this in Germany, and we did it with uh, with a sample of uh, more than fifty thousand households. Uh, that were followed from 1984 until 2016, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Mm -hmm. And what we see this is that the same household living in a house that is poorly maintained is systematically demanding more health care uh, than when they are in, a, in the when they are living in the period where the house is properly maintained. Okay. Uh, and that also in the other side. Similarly, when, when there is a renovation in the house with related to windows, with to heating and so forth, those 
that helped rebounds quite uh, quite significantly. So. And, and, and you see this by, for example, the number of doctor visits or reported um, reported health, right? Uh, or uh, a decrease in health complaints that people may have. Exactly. So okay. we have two sources of, uh, of information here. In one source of information, we, we use uh, a big high quality data set in Germany where households are interviewed every year. So they go to the same households year after year, and then they go and check their their demand for, for doctor visits and, and the days of sick leave and so forth. So this is one. So you see really like the number of uh, doctor visits go up uh, and it goes up especially for the elder uh, population, mm -hmm. something around two, uh, two extra visits per year linked to poor house maintenance. Mm -hmm. And then another, in another type of uh, research, we used even uh, hospital admission data. So Germany also, the same as in the Netherlands, they collect data on every single patient that steps in a hospital. So as soon as you step in a hospital, you generate a record that the CBS in the Netherlands or the National Statistical Office in, in Germany will put in a database and it will collect your age, your your place of residence, and and the the, the reason why you are in the hospital. There are these codes, right. so whether you are cardiovascular, respiratory, and so forth. So in that, we also see that housing renovations that took place in, especially in Eastern Germany, where they had a whole renovation package in the 90s, translated into better cardiovascular outcomes and respiratory outcomes. And again, okay. especially for the elder. Okay. Um, and this is what you research for houses. Did you also research other building categories? Yes. We did uh, schools uh, and we did offices. And in the, in the office side, we, we work very closely with the municipality of Venlo, where we follow the, the whole uh, workforce of the municipality moving from uh, some old buildings, uh, not not very highly performing, to a very uh, healthy building, fully designed for uh, to promote air quality yeah. with principles of natural ventilation and so forth. I think that most of the people listening to us from the Netherlands would probably have seen the building. And there, what we see is that uh, the same people moving, uh, the same people, the same workforce mm -hmm. living in the same houses of course yeah uh, just changing the workplace from a normal normal building to a healthy building had a substantial drop in the number of health complaints so in the old buildings they had, we had something like around 40 percent of people reporting that at some point mm -hmm. during the day they had things like headache uh, throat yeah. ache and or fatigue and all sorts of things these same people when they switched to the new one, one out of two of these people that were complaining stopped doing so immediately. And we followed them for two to three years. Yeah. Does those effects stay constant at the same level and, and with the same people? Same. And we follow at the same time a cohort that stayed working where these people were working. And, and those people didn't experience any change over these years. So it's nothing that has to do with general city policy of improving air quality in the city yeah. or anything. It's purely... The, work the building, the same people, exactly. Just with yeah. important implications for productivity as well, I guess, right? So, so yes. I mean, if you if you if you lose all those complaints, you can also be way more effective, more efficient on the workflow, and you're also happier as an employee. Exactly. So that is that is uh, so there are two things there, right? So, so you are more productive, definitely, but we mm -hmm. are also uh, a more loyal. Yeah, yeah, you're happy. Right? Yeah, yeah. We okay. we one of the things that. A lot of the big corporates are are complain are, are struggling to is always to retain talent and to uh, to generate value by keeping the the best people in the in the market in the job market. So all of these things, of course, are playing more and more of a role. And now that we have the technology to to make all of these aspects of a building visible to the tenants and to the yeah. occupants, is being a, a more of a differentiating factor for for employees to see where to go. So. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, what we talked about before is basically that real estate owners always try to live up to the minimum regulatory standards. But your research actually implies that there is value in doing more, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So one of the so we are by far not the first ones to look at how indoor air quality, indoor environmental quality affects occupants. This mm -hmm. is like a a long-standing field in public health, in engineering, yeah. 
they have done tons of research. Mm -hmm. uh, the difference is that uh, they have usually informed regulators into the spectrum of things that you really shouldn't let your building to have. So the very, yeah. very extremely bad conditions yeah. and how that translates into a very extreme also health outcomes. Now, like asbestos, for example. Exactly. Asbestos, yeah. lead paint, all of these mm -hmm. things that are really generating cancer. And yeah. so now we have from that type of buildings to like the very, very top performing buildings, almost like kind of well or something like kind of really like from the very extremes, like all the way in between, we have almost absolutely nothing to know how moving to the better translates yeah. into any health outcomes or performance outcomes. Mm -hmm. So this is where we try to jump in and we, we benefit a lot now by the, uh, the current trend of technology. So it used to be the reason why the, the science was in that way was also because it was very expensive to to go to an average house, to an average building, and measure these conditions, measuring ventilation rates, measuring particles, measuring temperature. Yeah. All of these things used to be done in a lab because of the how expensive the equipment was, how difficult was it to calibrate, all of these things. But now in the last five to 10, especially five years, you have this wave of sensor technology yeah. that are coming into the market that is are dropping the, the price of a sensor from a few thousand dollars to 100 euros and having also the technology to be able to have the data for all your portfolio or por your portfolio in front of you in your computer or even in your phone. So now what it is possible that we try to and we are doing and benefiting from is that it is more and more possible to go from an average person, an average office, an average house and link normal conditions over a certain amount of time to their health yeah. outcome and to the performance. That used okay. to be impossible. So now we are learning more and more how the average improvements have an, an impact in a normal person. Uh, yeah. Of, okay, so I think we have then established that there is actually a lot of value in doing more than the minimum re regulatory requirements, yeah. but also that there is a lot of technological availability to actually monitor what is going on inside of those walls. So um, what would then be some uh, key uh, uh, steps that you would advise real estate owners to undertake to uh, make their buildings more healthy for their tenants? And let's make a distinction in that sense between offices, uh, healthcare real estate and uh, houses or uh, stock of housing corporations. Yeah, let's start with, uh, with the commercial, with the, with the office side. Yeah. So one of the things that, that uh, we are seeing more and more, and that's something that I guess that is going to be, uh, I, I'm strong believer that it's going to be a, a widespread move, is measuring. Mm -hmm. In the same way that, that we are doing to build a research, I think that it's now more and more possible for, uh, for owners and for developers to do their own research in their own buildings. That means you have to stop, stop looking at the indoor environment uh, in your in your building as a black hole but yeah you have the technology now to be able to measure the performance of the spaces and it's affordable and it's actually being able especially for uh, for developers to assess in a very systematic way the performance of what you are producing mm -hmm. that used to be impossible and you used to be able to only do so by relying on occupant surveys that happen eventually and so forth. Now it is very, very much uh, possible to measure things like uh, CO2, that is uh, a, a good measure of ventilation, temperatures, yes. uh, mm -hmm. particles, VOCs uh, I would not recommend yet, but you also have the possibility to do so. So you have a lot of things that you can measure on a minute by minute basis. So you can yeah. really see your portfolio uh, from that point. Second of all, for especially for, I will go to the healthcare. The healthcare sector, the good thing of the healthcare sector is that they don't have the, the, the problem of not being the, uh, the managers of the people that are in those buildings mm -hmm. to a large mm -hmm. extent. So you have a, a quite some alignment of incentives and also a quite some alignment of 
data and so forth to really evaluate the condition, the impact of the conditions uh, of your buildings on the people that you're really producing to. And also one of the things that you have with healthcare, like uh, with nursery homes, for example, right? Like you have now more and more uh, a trend in places like the Netherlands of increasing the amount of assisted living, assisted living houses where we will host a lot of our elder population. For so, a longer period of time rather than, the, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Uh, so those people are also, their health is quite sensitive. It's way more sensitive than, than an adult. So mm -hmm. any problems will have a visible healthcare demand yeah. implications. Yeah. So you have the possibility to learn from, uh, and the technology and the methods are ready to learn from uh, the actual investments that you are taking in, in your portfolio with your people and evaluate yourself also how those things are translated into human benefits. Mm -hmm. Okay. So also real-time monitoring and real-time tracking in order to continuously track how the conditions of the building may affect the health of the people inside of the building. Exactly. Exactly. I think yeah. that I'm, I mean I my uh, uh, my partner is uh, is a is a doctor for the for the elderly, and and I I have to. To listen to her a lot of times saying that in the summer it's horrible to be in, in, in some of those places where people have to live, people mm -hmm. with heart conditions and so forth. But then we don't have when when the doctors are also having these reports of the reason for death. Uh, we have now, for example, now everybody's looking at how many people uh, has a cause of death related to COVID. Mm -hmm. We don't do that for something like heat. We don't do that for something like air quality because of course, doctors are, have limited time and, and we, we are still building the evidence, but it is time to start linking a lot of these things to, to the health of occupants. And, and we have a lot of evidence to, okay. to, to support that the health and the, sorry, the, the heart conditions and strokes and so forth and linking to extreme temperatures. I can tell you that almost any organ in your body has been linked in one of the studies in top medical journals to yeah. air pollution. Yeah. So, we have reasons to, to understand that what we are creating, this bubble of environment that we are creating in, in the buildings that we manage, we own and we develop, has yeah. an impact to, to the occupants. Yeah. Now we just have to build the, the information layer. Okay. And then if we look at uh, uh, tenants in uh, real estate owned by housing corporations, what advice would you give housing corporations in order to improve the health of the buildings, the, of the real estate? What I think that is, is again good to do is start building up the information layer that supports the investments that they are making. I think that one of the things that I've learned over these years of doing research in this, uh, this area is that when you want yourself to put your time and even your money to, to link uh, a lot of the changes in the portfolio of these corporations, mm -hmm. um, to the to the occupants health yeah you see that a lot of times even renovations and so forth they are not really documented in a proper way they are not really documented what happens where and or is documented only for the very immediate past years and then out you go beforehand then everything disappears and that is a problem yeah. right because you have a lot of these investments are not going to have uh, uh, an impact in the very very short run so okay. if you have a heart condition and I moved you uh, Wouter from your house to a very high performing house, mm -hmm. you can expect that your heart condition is not going to change from one day to the other. Yeah, it's a long term effect. Exactly. Yeah. So if okay. you only collect data for two years and then delete it from the previous two years and so forth, you know that all of the returns in health that you will measure are invisible to you because you mm -hmm. cannot, you don't wait long enough to uh, support your decisions. Yeah, and I think that in a lot of these, uh, there is a, a kind of like a gold mine for a lot of these housing corporations because at this moment they are somehow detached from a lot of the health policies of a lot of countries, mm -hmm. even though they are critical for good health outcomes in a lot of countries. Yeah. The reason why they are detached in a lot of cases is because they haven't been proven a lot of uh, 
that a lot of the investment that they are doing, and they do have an impact, that they are doing so with mm-hmm. data, with analysis, and so forth. So I think that we are also part of the problem in this. We need to cultivate the the uh, the policy of back up a lot of this investment, not only from the rent or from the uh, transaction price that a lot of yeah. these housing corporations cannot mm-hmm. adjust and expand these to another price. framework of thinking, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and, and if I understand you correctly, what is really important to do now is to make sure that you start monitoring and start tracking everything you're doing with your buildings related to how healthy they are so you can support your investments. Exactly. If you know what is going on um, in the buildings, basically. Exactly. Um, what would you advise building owners to do to make their buildings more corona-proof related to what we just talked about, healthy buildings? Yeah, so I will give a little bit of, uh, uh, I will start a little bit with, the, um, with the, what the epidemiologists are saying and what the, the doctors are saying. So kind of the, the key thing for, for COVID is, that, is, a, is an airborne disease. Uh, virus. Uh, so something like keeping the airflows in your uh, buildings clean of virus is the key for your tenants not to get infected. Mm-hmm. That means if you have, uh, as soon as you have someone that is infected in, in the building, the more air circulation that you have in your building, the less likely is that he will infect the others. Yeah. That's from the building. Of course, you have all of the policies that are by all of the national governments of disinfecting masks and some government masks, some others. So, so together with all of this, for the building owner perspective, ventilation is the key thing to, mm-hmm. to, to look at and to, to optimize. Okay. Now, this is also not nothing new. Uh, this is something that basically COVID is just raising awareness of the relevance of ventilation. Mm, yeah. There is, it is nothing that, it is nothing new, right? It's nothing yeah, that yeah, 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 we yeah. are learning that ventilation is important. We are learning that low levels of CO2 is important. We knew that. Now, yeah. what we are learning is, is the, the new stakes of that, uh, of that strategy. Yeah. It used to be that uh, ventilate, good ventilation and uh, a well-ventilated room was a nice to have, and that some people will complain about these headaches when when they were not uh, being in a ventilated room. But yeah. now we know that on top of that, the transmission of virus are, are much higher. Okay. So the urgency is higher, basically, to make sure that your installations are well maintained, for example. Uh, uh, and, and to make sure that the overall uh, ventilation and circulation of air in your building is up to date. It's up to date. And for that, again, the question is, do you even know what is mm-hmm. the ventilation rate in, in the houses that you manage? Yeah, yeah. So it starts with measuring what we just talked about with, with uh, uh, knowing what's going on in your building portfolio. Exactly. I will give you an example also how, also how if you were doing things correctly before COVID, mm-hmm you are almost covered for for the post covid period yeah. um, if you look at a lot of the the building standards for uh, for from the major engineering and major agencies in the world like ashra is one of the big, biggest ones here in the uh, in the united states they usually say around 1000 ppm is uh, is a good level of co2 indoors yeah. uh, it's a good target and that's what most of the industry is, is looking at. And going beyond that is going to be beneficial, but they don't uh, have a strong opinion about that. There are mm-hmm. research going, if you go beyond that, like uh, uh, research from Harvard, that that will have uh, benefits. Okay. Yeah. We can start the discussion about whether with COVID that will be 900 or, or 950. So these marginal changes in, in the ventilation rates. Now, if you compare now, uh, you look at ventilation rates in places like schools. We are talking that it's not that they were far by 100 ppm or, or something like that. They were, they were far by 1,000 or 2,000 ppm in a lot of okay, places. Wow. Yeah. So, and that is seen study after study. So we have buildings that, hasn't, uh, that haven't met any standard 
even by a close order of magnitude for a long time, not only for COVID, but even from before. They were said already, you have to be around 1,000 and so forth. All of those, they were double, triple of the level that they were on average, on a regular day, they were in that. So, and they were having consequences that we uh, par partly mapped. Now what happens is that they have consequences that are very serious and in a very short term. So not doing your homework have mm -hmm. a way higher stakes than it used yeah. to be. Yeah, okay. But the recommendations, if you see what a lot of the building managers are saying, they are not changing a lot of the standards in terms of, of that. Of course, they are now busy also talking with about UV light and other things that are kind of even on top more of a, a protective measure. But the very basic things, they didn't really change. They were not asking to do any extra mile. They were just asking to do, in a lot of cases, do your homework and okay. do what we recommended you to do for already a decade. Okay. So, so, so basically, uh, the, the urgency has increased and maybe this is an opportunity to say, okay, now we really need to start monitoring what is going on inside our buildings and we really need to uh, make sure that we act when the conclusion is that uh, the ventilation level is not up to date uh, and the PPM levels are too high, what you just said, from the standpoint. Exactly. So we can also frame this as a chance, basically. I yeah, think it's, so. a, it's changing awareness. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, moving forward, right? Uh, 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 you're continuously researching uh, uh, this topic. Where do you think uh, the research will uh, uh, move towards? What do you think the future of the research will be in this area? Well, I think that the uh, the, the research in this area will keep benefiting more and more from from improvements in, in availability and affordability of sensing technology. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I see more and more is also collaborations between researchers, uh, building owners and, and corporations to do these things together, these evaluations. So that, that is a good thing. Yeah. One of the things is that I, of course, would, one of the, like now we have the, the global uh, stressor of COVID. Mm -hmm. The next one that is already here and that we are now not talking as much as we, we usually do is climate change. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the, the problems and a lot of the, the health issues that are already um, uh, discovered by the health science, but we need to know more about what does it mean for a regular portfolio is, is temperatures and extreme temperatures. And I think yeah. that the Netherlands is a very good uh, example always when it comes to climate change. But this time it's not only from flood risk, but also from temperatures. I think that I lived there for four years. Yeah. And year after years, I could see that the amount of days that are terribly warm, warm are increasing. Mm -hmm. So things like starting to adapt your portfolio to, uh, to deal with extremely uh, hot days that has to do that has to be in the agenda and it has to be in the agenda right. for researchers and also right. for 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 owners because what it used to be an special summer of having one month of very warm days yeah it's not a special anymore no no it's becoming a new a more normal during the summer so this is also a, a new area of research then yeah that will grow Okay, um, well, uh, thanks a lot uh, uh, for your thoughts, uh, Juan, and uh, uh, for talking to us uh, today about this very interesting and relevant topic. Um, then for our viewers, um, I would like to say that we have published a number of videos about how Corona will affect buildings, uh, 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 the way in which we create our built environment, um, but also how uh, we have handled uh, pandemics like this in the past related to real estate. So uh, please do look at those videos. You can find them in the comments. And thank you again, Juan, for your time and being with us today. Thank you so much.